Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. And uh, thank you for all the attendees that were commenting in the chat about not being able to see my screen. That would have been a terrible way to start a webinar here, uh, but I'm glad we got that all resolved. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and get started here and maybe just want to start off by saying thanks again to everybody for hopping on here today. I'm um, really excited to talk to you guys about the visual economy and what you can be doing with 3D configuration as the business. Um, maybe just by way of introduction, my name is Ben Whitmer. I'm an account executive here with 3Kit, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the visual economy. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Tony Lopez, a solution engineer with our team, who's going to be walking through a couple of product demonstrations. We thought we'd spend some time doing both of those things, but um, I would encourage everybody to use the chat or the Q&A function to ask questions. Our plan is to answer questions um, at the end as they arise. Perfect. Well, I think we're all here today because, I mean, candidly, we now live in the era of customer experience. You know, customer experience is really how a lot of companies are defining how they engage and sell products. And when you start thinking about how you engage with customers, e-commerce has really changed how people buy. You know, whether you sell B2B or B2C, um, there's now a lot more competition because uh, new product is a quick search away. And when you start thinking about how you go to market and the traffic that's being driven to your website when you're looking to sell products, you know, roughly a quarter of the traffic to your site are shoppers that are actively comparing your products to your competition. And so the question really becomes, you know, when a customer can buy anything and they can look at anything, how do you stand out? And how do you then translate, you know, standing out into a meaningful customer experience that allows you to get there? There's a lot of companies out there, candidly, and not trying to paint a, a scary story here, but that have struggled in the transition to a meaningful customer experience digitally. Um, you know, I think most of the, the folks that are on this call have something in common with all of the logos that you see up here on the screen. And it's in the fact that you are a product company. You sell a tangible good that somebody can, you know, typically interact with. And the thing that's kind of crazy about all of these companies is they couldn't translate what maybe an in-store experience was like to how somebody would engage with those same products digitally. And maybe just to kind of call out what, you know, one of these companies that was just announced earlier this week is uh, Art Van Furniture. So Art Van Furniture had 190 stores here in the Midwest. They were a furniture brand, um, but they had traditionally been a company that only had an in-store footprint. They sent out traditional product catalogs um, via snail mail. And when you go look at their site, you know, there isn't a whole lot that separates Art Van Furniture from any other furniture company online. And so today, as we start talking about some of those things, you know, I think it's important to kind of key in on companies that are out there delivering on a, you know, a high quality digital customer experience. So with that said, right, who is disrupting the market? What companies are really honed in on customer experience and, and reaping the rewards? Um, folks that have been kind of following the, the market have probably heard a lot about Wayfair, right? There's a, they're a company that was founded in 2002. They're about 6.8 billion in their annual revenue. These aren't exact numbers, um, but Wayfair is an online only business, right? And they're consistently trying to find ways to engage consumers online. And for years and years, everyone said, hey, there's no way that you could possibly sell furniture online. People need to do the, the butt in seat test. Well, Wayfair is, is proving the market wrong. You know, they've introduced a lot of different tools that they've invested a lot of time and energy into to changing how people engage with products digitally. They're launching 3D experiences. They have massive 2D content generation. They're doing things with augmented reality to give that in-store experience online. And by delivering these types of meaningful customer engagements with their products, they've been able to capture 10% of the furniture market online only. 
another maybe good example of this is uh, a company may, a lot of you have probably heard of, Warby Parker. So Warby Parker was founded in 2010. Um, they're little over half a billion dollars in annual revenue. What's kind of crazy is their story is very similar to Wayfair. You know, everyone said, hey, you cannot sell glasses online. And Warby Parker said, we think you're wrong. And while they only own, you know, roughly 2% of the, the furniture market based upon, you know, information that's publicly available, they own about 50% of the online sales. And if you go to Warby Parker's site, you'll see what they're doing from a visualization perspective. They have the tools to do things like augmented reality and virtual try-on. And what becomes really exciting is, you know, this becomes an open forum for a lot of folks to reshape what customer experiences look like. Whether you're a B2C company that has, um, you know, a brick and mortar presence only, or you're uh, a B2B company that is traditionally sold through channel members or with sales reps. You know, every customer out there is now obsessed with visually immersive experiences. They want a meaningful customer experience. And if they're buying a tangible product, they want to be able to engage with that product. And I think what's, what's interesting here, you know, e-commerce has been around for quite some time, right? A few decades now. But when you look at a lot of the analytics and a lot of the research that's out there, people are still saying that visuals are the most impactful thing that influence a purchase decision. And where this becomes a really unique opportunity for a lot of folks is when you're thinking about customer experience, customers are now demanding more and more and more visual content. They want that tactile-esque approach digitally. So in 2016, you know, consumers were anticipating and asking for three photos of a product before they made a purchase decision. As of 2019, they now expect to see eight, and that's not slowing down anytime soon. And so that becomes a, you know, a really interesting question is, how do you keep up with the content generation needs? How do you keep up with the content generation needs while delivering on a meaningful customer experience? And that's exactly what 3Kit in our platform is designed to help you do. Um, when we start thinking about that, the, the CX needs, it all starts with this idea of a product right? Being able to organize your content meaningfully into products and into parts that are ultimately going to be configurable. And when we start talking about visualization and configuration, right, this is where we fundamentally start attaching rules that say, hey, when the color's red, this is how we create this type of experience. When an, an animation could help educate a customer on how your product should be used, this is where we create the rules to define how somebody can interact with that visual experience. And where this becomes really exciting is, again, whether you're a B2B company or you're a B2C company, you have the capacity to leverage visualization throughout your entire go-to-market strategy. Um, whether it's a tool to guide channel sales reps on how to effectively position your products, um, whether it's a tool that allows a consumer to drop a piece of furniture in into their own home to see if it fits their space. All of this can be done directly from the platform. And what's so exciting is you start to be able to do reporting and analytics around what types of visual experiences are really moving the needle for your business. So as we talk about, you know, this being useful across all different industries, um, you know, wanted to highlight a few different customers that we're working with here and, and in different use cases. So Boston Tech it sells exclusively B2B. Um, and one of the things that they were really struggling with is how do we help, you know, our, our channel members, our, our customers that want, you know, the personalized workstation of their dreams envision what that could come, to be, come together and, and represent. And when you start talking about all the configuration options that they had, it was something like 1.2 million different iterations of how something could be configured. So by delivering an interactive 3D configuration experience, a customer can truly visualize all those uh, different permutations without having to take pictures. And while that's B2B, that differs completely from tailored brands who are struggling with something very similar. You know, as tailored brands, you might know them as Men's Warehouse, Joseph Abu, Joseph A. Bank. Um, 
one of the things that's really unique about Taylor Brands is they have one of the world's largest collection of fabrics that's used in custom suits. And so when somebody's going in to get a custom suit, they really want to understand what that suit's going to look like. But imagine trying to take over a billion photos to represent your product catalog. There's just no meaningful way to do it. So having the capacity to visually automate a lot of the assembly um, and configuration rules for how a suit can be sold makes a huge difference. You know, they're seeing results like a 20%, 26% lift in uh, upselling on the interior lining of the custom suits that they're selling. And Ciroc's kind of a, another use case here. So uh, I'm sure everyone on the phone, if they're of legal age, has bought alcohol. Um, and you've probably bought it from, you know, a grocery store or, or um, you know, your local binnies like we have here in Chicago. So Ciroc already has an existing distribution model with wholesalers, but they were trying to find ways to engage directly with the end consumer without disrupting their existing distribution channels. So Ciroc launched personalization as a part of their go-to-market strategy. So a consumer can put together the Ciroc bottle of their dreams, personalize it with things like happy birthday, happy holidays, to make it a meaningful gift. It allows them to sell each of their you know, bottles for an extra nickel capturing margin, but gives them direct access to consumers that they didn't uh, originally have. So as we start talking about all of these different types of experiences, you know, the thing that's kind of universal when we start talking about a clear customer experience, when you sell a product, that product is the customer experience. And so defining how people can interact, engage with that product visually becomes really impactful to driving conversion rates and driving the type of customer experience you're looking for. So whether it's creating images that draw people in, whether it's an interactive 3D uh, configuration experience, whether it's augmented reality, 3Kit's platform is capable of launching all these different types of experiences. And as we look to go through the demo here today, we're really gonna be honing in on that tactile experience that 3D configuration brings to the table. So with that said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn the reins over to my colleague, Tony. Great, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you everyone for joining. As Ben mentioned earlier, uh, Tony Lopez. So I work side by side with Ben from the solution engineering side of the house. And I'll walk us through a couple of those use cases that Ben introduced with those couple of slides. And as Ben mentioned, when it comes to 3Kit, Really, the only requirement is that you have a physical product with more than one option. And so that's why we see our customer base ranging from direct B to C, directly to the customer use cases, perhaps through, uh, through a website or through e-commerce. Uh, some of the other use cases that Ben was talking about, whether it's B2B, uh, business to business and selling through distribution or channel networks, or even in-store like tailored brands on, on an iPad, iOS device directly there in store. So really the only requirement is uh, again, that, uh, that it's a physical product and at least that there's an internet connection. So, so I don't know that we can uh, necessarily be made available to somebody in Timbuktu, but for, for anybody else, it's all in the browser, it's all on the web, no need to download any additional apps or even uh, any, any plugins for your browser. So the first thing that I'm gonna take a look at here uh, is, is very straightforward. So it's a simple watch, at least it looks simple at first glance. Um, right, a watch is just going to be really at the end of the day one single product. But when it comes to 3D personalization, Bamford really does take it to the next level in what they offer their customers. So you can see I've got a few different options here uh, when it comes to just the band, for example. But the moment I hit leather, I all of a sudden have a number of different color options for the threading. If I want to change to this more of the, the, the NATO strap. Again, a, a number of different color options here. And as I'm doing this, you'll notice that I don't have to reload the watch every time. Uh, as I click each individual configuration option, each individual color option, maybe I want to go back to the rubber, uh, the rubber strap here. We're gonna automatically update just that single piece of 3D. Uh, oftentimes you might see something where I have to go through uh, fill out all the different options that I want and click a resubmit button. Now I have to reload that entire model again. 
So what we're doing here is from a single 3D model. And inside of this 3D model, it's constructed of a few dozen different components of 3D, a few dozen different 3D shapes, of course, things like the strap. But now as I start walking through the different dial options and even the individual, the individual dials and arm options here, all of those are individual pieces of 3D that live inside of this model. And so since they're individual targetable pieces of 3D geometry or 3D shapes inside of this watch model, I can use my configuration options over here on the right-hand side to dynamically change all those and visualize them in real time. And at the end of the day, with all of my different strap options, all of the different color options, uh, there are literally uh, uh, tens of thousands, if not maybe even hundreds of thousands of options here. And if you're getting into this level of personalization, of course, every customer is going to want to not only visually see all of the tactile elements, right, the difference in, in the, the texture of rubber to metal to glass, but they're also going to need to visualize 100% of all of those personalization and color options which in traditional photography or traditional, uh, uh, traditional e-commerce, there's no way, of course, to manufacture those tens and tens of thousands of different watch combinations. And at the end of the day, in, in an effort to give full visibility to the customer before they make that purchasing decision, we really need to visualize to the customer exactly what they're going to get their hands on and using something like 3Kit where we can now just dynamically run through again literally tens of thousands of permutations uh, we're really really opening the door for a number of different experiences uh, the last thing that i wanted to show here is also um, personalization so something that of course uh, we would never be able to take a picture of and for bamford it's uh, it's very straightforward i don't know if we caught that but right here above the mayfair uh, there's just two initials there so if we wanted to uh, go to the website and, and maybe see what it would look like with my initials there in the back and even around here on the backhand side, there's some engraving here. And what I wanted to call out is notice also the difference. Um, notice the difference of when I etch something on the back of the metal case here versus the, the colored paint of the front. Uh, so here we just kind of have a personalization that looks like we're etching directly out of the metal. And again, on the front hand side, it looks like we're painting something there onto the dial. So, a number of different types of styles, fonts, colors, and visual effects that we can achieve also through through that personalization and adding of text, or even in some use cases, and we have some customers doing things like uploading of company logos for, for example, corporate swag, corporate materials, and, and, and corporate, uh, uh, corporate gifts. Uh, the next example, uh, Ben actually um, spoke about this a little bit on that previous slide, is Boston Tech. So Boston Tech, again, uh, as Ben mentioned, there are millions and millions of permutations of how to configure a workstation. And for Boston Tech, uh, they are selling a lot through those channels, through those dealers. Uh, you can see here there's no, uh, for example, add to cart button, um, whereas on the Banford website, I, I, of course, could. But the first the couple of things that I want to call out is also notice um, that on the right-hand side, I don't have uh, any any configuration options currently. I've just got these few few basic options. I can cycle through some different base units. You can see I have different sizes as well. We'll keep it uh, we'll keep it to something a little bit wider here. A few different casters and components, but as I'm doing this, you'll notice that uh, 3Kit is just going to dynamically grab these individual components and bring them directly into this instantiation or this configuration that I'm interacting with here on the website. So instead of having to model all of those different combinations, right, kind of thinking back to the example with the watch, where it's just a single product and there are a few different pieces of 3D parts, in, uh, uh, parts inside of there, the different shapes. When it comes to building something like a workstation, there are literally hundreds of individual components that can potentially go into the configuration. I'm gonna grab a work surface here and then we'll notice over on the right hand side, all of my other configuration options are now available. Right, so we see a little bit of rules, uh, of rules and constraint there as well, that only once I've satisfied my basic requirements here, do I now have the options to do anything else. Uh, but as I was mentioning, as I work through this, and maybe I want to add some uprights here, and you can see I have some shelving options. And just as I'm doing this, there are literally hundreds of different parts and components that there's no way for me to actually model something like that together. 
So what 3Kit is doing is I have a library of all these individual 3D components that just kind of float around on their own in 3D space. And it's only when I do something like click on this steel shelf 15 inch by 30 that it's going to dynamically pull that into my scene. Uh, maybe I want this overhead storage cabinet and it's not going to work. It's, it's not going to work there. And you can see it's actually highlighted in green. If I try to move it up, uh, it's going to recognize that there's something already in the way. And so I have to move it over to the right hand side. And we know that it fits there properly and also within just a certain certain range. Right. So I can't move it below the, the surface top there and I certainly can't move it off of the uprights. So when it comes to just bringing in all of these individual components, dynamically assembling a fully configured to order product on the fly, and also recognizing all the spatial relationships between what is inside of my configuration, uh, Boston Tech is really taking it to the next level of 3D configuration and something that is very, very highly rules-based. Um, also, you can see here, uh, I don't have any options currently under dividers or, or under self-lighting. And that's because, again, when we're talking about dependencies and, and relationships between the items that we're configuring, um, the system knows that, well, just dividers and under self lighting doesn't fit on the overhead storage cabinet. Now, once upon a time with traditional configuration methods, I might have to open up a spreadsheet and cross reference what's available for me, right? That introduces a very high margin for error whether I'm an internal associate working for Boston Tech, and it certainly introduces a huge margin for error if I'm an external distributor or if even if I'm a potential end customer who wants to configure something or order a desk. Now, with that being said, you'll notice when I click on my, my shelf that I originally added here, I now have options to do things like add a divider and also some undershelf lighting. So I'll just spin this around a little bit so we can see the underside there, and maybe I wanna grab that fluorescent light as well. Uh, so again, from this standpoint, we now are, we're not only allowing for, as Ben had mentioned earlier, those millions of different permutations, and they can be in the form of adding on it, uh, individual components that we see here. They can be in the form of maybe I just wanna have a very bright yellow, and I think this is what we had on the screenshot, a very bright yellow desk. Uh, but we're also now removing 100% that possibility to configure something that Boston Tech just can't build. Uh, for example, another uh, another thing would be if I wanted to just keep on adding some shelves here, uh, I'm, I'm pushing this button, but I can't keep adding more because, well, there's just no space for it. Right? So now Boston Tech has removed that margin for error that anything that comes in, they know they can build it because it's not only technically valid, but it's also just possible to do given the confines of, of the space of the, of the unit that they're actually building here. Uh, so again, with all that being said, just to kind of wrap up, uh, we wanted to look at a couple of different use cases, both B2C, where the configuration isn't very involved. Uh, there aren't many components, but there are a lot of different color options. And even though it was just a number of different color options, there were still tens of thousands of different visualizations or permutations that the customer is going to have to see before they decide to add that to the shopping cart. And then again, we wanted to move all the way to kind of the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we, chose, we chose Boston Tech for that to show something that's more selling through distribution channels and allowing for that omni-channel selling approach. And again, all still online, all still directly through the browser, so I don't have to download anything additional onto my, onto my device. Uh, but now we're getting into a whole new world of dependencies and, and part references and componentization. Um, so, so again, just wanted to share a couple of examples that really communicate that broad reach of, of three kit use cases and, and three kit capabilities. Uh, so with that said, I think there were a couple of questions that were coming in through the chat. Ben, I'll, I'll toss it back to you as well to see if you wanted to add any additional color on that uh, before we start getting into questions. And of course, at this point, we want to open it up to, to the full audience for any other questions that, uh, uh, that haven't yet been asked in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. And uh, yeah, as, as uh, we look to respond to questions here, I just want, did want to take a moment and say thank you all for, for joining here today. Hopefully, our quick overview and demonstration started to highlight, you know, how 3Kit can help drive meaningful customer experiences, whether it's in B2B or B2C. Looks like um, there's a number of questions here. So first question yeah. that I'm seeing is, have you seen your customer base grow their omni-channel strategy with 3Kit? Um, Tony, do you want to respond yeah, to this? Say, I'm happy I, to I, say too. Yeah. 
I, I was going to say, I, I, I saw that one kind of towards the end there when I started talking about that. I think I even used the word omni-channel. Uh, so I don't know, we, we, can, we can probably bypass that one. Uh, but again, the, the main thing there is whether, again, uh, because everything is web-based, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's B2C, but the main thing when we start getting into something much more difficult to assemble and configure when it comes to uh, uh, something like business to business or if we're selling through distribution, the education factor is going to be difficult. And so with a rules-based configurator, we are ensuring that everything the user clicks on is going to be technically and commercially valid. Uh, so that's how we can support exposing these configurators and uh, 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 giving access to all of our perhaps less knowledgeable, uh, less technically knowledgeable uh, customers and distributors and, and give them uh, something that is going to be fully, full, fully error proof. Um, so that's how we like to approach Omnichannel and that's largely the, the same with, with traditional configuration tools. Um, uh, I could have shown, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the jewelry one for, for a second here. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, the, the steel metal renderings, um, I, there are a couple options there. And actually, I invite anyone on the phone to um, go to either one of those websites, Danford or Boston Tech. Uh, Boston Tech did, did actually have a few other metal options, some uh, metal work stations. Uh, and, and again, so we can start to really see the, the different kind of tactile elements when it comes to 3D, 3D visualization for anything from fabrics to plastics and even to metals. Um, ben, I'll, I don't know if, you, if we want to just kind of go back and forth here, if you want to answer a couple there. Sure. Yeah, so uh, another question that was asked here is, is 3Kit a good fit for jewelry? Um, great question. So absolutely yes. I mean, if anyone here has bought an engagement ring, I'm sure that you have gone through a very – Overwhelming experience sitting down with a jewelry sales rep who has then taken you through, well, here's all the different bands that we offer. Here's all the different settings. Here's the ring you know, or the, the uh, different stones that we offer. Do you want a pave finish or not? You know, how do you want your, your diamond to be cut? Do you want a diamond? You know, a lot of these questions that the sales rep is asking in store with a customer are things that, frankly, that customer could be doing by themselves online. They could be designing the, the engagement ring of their dreams and then coming in and having a meaningful conversation with the sales rep if and when the timing's right or simply just check out online. Um, really, when we start thinking about jewelry, it's, is it a configurable product? And, uh, you know, really any industry where there's some form of change happening to the product is a great fit for what we do here at 3 Um Another question do I have to do my entire product line or can it be an a la carte basis? Uh, Tony, you want to field this one? Sure. Uh, that is a question that we often, uh, that we often receive from customers that have a very expansive product portfolio. Um, so from a three kit standpoint, uh, we don't necessarily want to boil the ocean just because someone sells 5,000 different things. Doesn't mean we have to start with 5,000, uh, 5,000 products. So oftentimes we'll start with, you know, what are those best sellers? Where are we going to see the biggest return, uh, the biggest return with what our top sellers are? And from a three kit standpoint, and this is actually going to bleed into um, uh, to Robert's first question uh, around whether uh, this is a managed service and who sets it up. Uh, what we would do in that in that situation is uh, set up a few configurations for again those top products, and it's all done on on the three kit platform. So what that means is if you have 3D models, if you're working with a design agency, if you have manufacturing files or CAD files, a uh, three kit really doesn't care where those 3D files came from. We'll take them, we'll import them into the platform. And now we're gonna start to componentize them. We're gonna start to build that configuration around them and just deploy it across any channel. Uh, so we'll often do that with a small subset of products. And then so from that point, we can start analyzing and looking at the metrics of what's being configured, what's being purchased, is it working well, what's not working so well. And so that gives us a little bit of strategy and insight into what products do we want to onboard next. And that also segues into the first half of Robert's question or the second half of Robert's question, which is, is it managed services? Well, when we get to that introduction of new product lines, um, uh, what we can, what we really start seeing now is because it is again a SaaS platform and it's it's a declarative rules-based platform. Now customers can can go in there and and add new products on their own, build new configurators on their own. We will provide 100% uh, uh, support and and all of the training required so that our customers can take ownership of that implementation. 
And at the end of the day, if a customer still wants three kits to manage those changes from a managed services standpoint, uh, yes, we also, we also have that available. Um, so um, awesome. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I'm seeing another question here, which is a question that we commonly get. Where do the 3D models come from? Um, so great question. 3D models can come from a variety of different places. Um, and we kind of deal with companies that are on all different, uh, what I would say, places in their visualization journey. Some of the companies that we work with have never done anything in 3D ever, and that's A-OK. -okay. We can absolutely create 3D models as a part of a project deliverable. Other companies we work with have fully flushed 3D-ified everything um, and they're looking for a more meaningful configuration experience and customer experience for allowing customers to engage with those 3d products um, so regardless of where you're starting from we can support you there whether it's us creating the models whether it's you know an independent 3d artist that your team is comfortable with or even if your team already has 3d models all of those are a good starting place for us um, and next oh, go ahead. Uh, Ben, I, I, I was just going to say uh, I missed um, uh, uh, Pierre's questions here on on the Boston Tech configurator and the addition of rules. Uh, and so there was a little bit that we touched on with Robert's previous question of who who manages it, right? Is it is it three kit or is it the end customer? Um, that all depends on the individual customer and what their business wants to do. Uh, and the way we approach it is uh, we want everything to be as declarative and data driven as possible. So that's something like the addition of new rules, new dependencies is in a format where um, uh, the business or, or I should say that the, the end customer themselves uh, um, can do that. Now, of course, that requires that we train them on, on the format and we train them on the platform. Um, but that too, at the end of the day, uh, our ideal is, is for customers to to manage those those new rules, new products. Uh, 3Kit doesn't want to be uh, necessarily in the business of services um, because again, we know that there are a number of agencies, a number of uh, um, uh, uh, folks out there that, um, that can provide that. We know that our end customers are already working with services companies and those, those companies know the current landscape of, of that given company. So we don't wanna disrupt any of that and we want to empower uh, the end customer to take as much ownership as possible when it uh, when it comes to that. Um, I was going to uh, also use that then as an opportunity to to respond to uh, um, Alexander's question here of how the configurators are built. Um, and so it's always going to be a joint effort. Again, I, I don't know if this question is more so asking from the standpoint of how does it initially get stood up. Where again, 3Kit will do that because it is on the 3Kit platform, and we have to train uh, we have to train folks on on how the platform works. Um, but in terms of defining what those roles are, um, oftentimes our customers will know what all of their product rules, dependencies, and relationships are. And it can be sent over in the format of very simple kind of matrices that will then go and configure and declare those rules. Uh, so one of those examples was if I have an overhead cabinet, then there are no under shelf lights available. But if I have that uh, 18 inch by 30 inch cabinet, I want to make available the option to select uh, select a couple of lights. Uh, that's a very, very simple, if uh, if this is a scenario, then I want to make available the lights. Uh, really anyone can configure that, it's all declarative. Um, so we will often help uh, customers go through their product catalog and define those relationships if they don't have it already defined. If they do have it defined, great, then we'll plug it into the configurator um, and make sure to do that alongside our customers so our customer knows exactly how it works, exactly what's being configured, so that they can go update those rules and add new rules as needed. Uh, sorry, Ben, I cut you off. I think you had a different uh, um, question in mind that you wanted to respond to. No, no, no. That was, that was great. Um, maybe the next question here, and thank you, everybody, for all the questions here. This is awesome, and I will say this. If for some reason we run out of time here, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team. We can share information in a follow-up email about how to get in touch, um, just in case folks do need to drop. Next question that I see here is, beyond a typical e-commerce site, do, can any of your customers use your 3D created images on Amazon? So, um, great question. Our customers have complete ownership over the digital assets. 
that are a part of a 3Kit engagement. If you want to export any of the 3D models inside of our platform, they are yours to do so with. And that holds true for any of the file formats that get fed out of our system. So whether it is a 3D file, whether it's a, it's a rendered image, whether it's a augmented reality file format, you're free to do with that what you choose to do. Um, so if you want to be able to you know, push your images into Amazon as a part of helping people buy through that platform, you absolutely could. Um, next question, which engine do you use to render all assets on the web? Which kind of reference do you need to produce assets? Uh, Tony, maybe would you want to respond to this one? Uh, sure, sure. That's uh, kind of just the, the, the opposite end of the question you just answered, where it's, it's what can we output, right? We can output all these different file formats. At the end of the day, 3Kit doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't really care, right? Again, we don't want to force anyone into a corner of you have to work with this, that, or the other specific file format. Uh, so we work with, and we have it, we have it online. There, there, there are over a dozen different uh, 3D formats, anything from CAD to different 3D files. Um, and oftentimes there's something that, you know, maybe doesn't work um, uh, perfectly well with it, but there's always going to be an intermediary. Uh, and again, the idea there is oftentimes our customers will have manufacturing files or they will have already contracted out to an agency to create 3D files and 3D representations of their products. We don't want to have to recreate that from, uh, from square one. So we'll just work with, uh, with, with whatever those files, uh, whatever those files and formats are. Um, that, that's similar to um, uh, this other question here that came in down at the bottom of uh, any limitations when visualizing permutations, options, product size. Uh, so product size is a consideration, right? Because it is being done over, um, uh, over a browser. We want to make sure that whatever that file is, that it's not terribly heavy because we do want to ensure that we have the best performance uh, for, for our end users. Uh, so again, there's no practical, uh, excuse me, there's, there's no hard set limit, but there are practical limitations. And there are the same thing, there's no hard set limit for permutations, but there are practical limitations. We, by all means, we can throw 100 attributes on there and give 2,000 different options to, uh, to our customers, but um, that wouldn't make for a very good user experience. I don't think anybody, anybody would ever use it. So again, uh, not so much uh, hard technical limits, it's more so practical limits that, uh, uh, that really are driven from a best practices type of approach. Um, with that said, I don't know, Ben, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, but I, I think we end at, at 9.45 here or 45 minutes past on, on California. So um, yeah. I don't know if we wanna start wrapping up here soon. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, it, that's why I wanted to preface before. It looks like we have something um, close to 14 more questions here. Um, and I, I will encourage everybody, um, you know, to reach out to us, contact us um, via our website at, on, on a contact us form or feel free to email our team at sales at 3kit.com. Um, I do want everyone to know that this webinar was recorded and you are more than welcome to distribute this as you see fit to. Um, we're gonna be sending a follow-up email with access to the recording. And uh, again, I just wanna take a moment to thank everybody for attending today. I uh, appreciate all the great questions here at the end and thanks for giving us an opportunity to talk about customer experience and, and what 3Kit can do to reshape how you're engaging with your customers. Thanks again, everybody, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.